Yes, hello. It's no fun living through history, is it? It's confusing. It's intense. Life is murky and full of unknowns. Nobody can figure out exactly what's going on. And in fact, nobody probably will figure out what's going on until somebody 50 years from now puts it all together and probably gets the story wrong anyways. But I hope that you're hanging in there in the accursed year of our Lord 2020. And what I can't offer is that this is a period of ripening karma. Karma tends to ripen all at once, just out of some sheer perversity. I'm not sure. You've probably had periods in your life of a day or a week or a year when it just seems like everything that can possibly go wrong does go wrong. That's karma ripening in clusters. I don't know how, I don't know why it works that way. I don't make the rules, but it does. That obviously applies to individuals, it applies to cultures, and I'll mention this. When karma is ripening, the best thing that you can do is to lean back a little bit and just pay attention. Allow it to do its thing. Allow yourself to, um, how do I put it? Allow yourself to pierce to the meaning of what is occurring. And the best way that you can do that, by the way, is that as events arise, just simply try to witness them without attachment or aversion. So don't try to cling to it and don't try to run away from it. Just witness it. This is, so I am told, the best way to process the ripening of karma because the whole point is you don't want to continue creating more of it. In that spirit, I have been stepping back a little bit and just listening and watching and seeing how things are developing, which things are obviously developing very, very quickly, and continually asking myself, how can I truly help here? What can I, what perspective or information or tools can I bring to the discussion that really uh, will help rather than throw fuel on the fire? And I've come up with several answers to that, and I will say this. Um, no matter where you are on the political spectrum or what your opinions uh, are at the moment or the model that you have a, you have formed of, uh, you know, or the, re the reaction you have formed to the events of the last several months, one thing's probably for sure, and that that is that this has been fairly traumatic, right? And that it's a lot to process. It's a lot to process. Uh, to varying degrees depending on the individual, but everyone is going through a traumatizing process. Some people will be traumatized by it, and some people will be resilient and healthy and be able to mitigate that. And how people navigate this is going to make the difference there, and it's a really big deal. So here's what I have to bring to the table. The first thing is this podcast. So this is an interview with Dr. Cole Marta, who treats PTSD for a living, uh, he does so as uh, in part of his clinical practice is uh, in, connection with map, in, in connection with MAPS, who are the people that are doing the research on bringing entheogens and psychedelics uh, to uh, therapeutic professionals to use legally, particularly MDMA, which I, you know, I'll just say this, I'm not that interested in drugs, right? I'm just not, uh, you know, I've, I've been through all of that. Uh, I'm in a different phase of my life. Uh, it, you know, the people seeing DMT elves or whatever, it's just, it's, I've had those conversations. They're not particularly interesting to me anymore. However, one thing that I believe in passionately, not because it is connected with um, um, psychedelics or whatever, but because it is connected with healing and the deep processing of in many cases, multi-generational trauma, is MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. And that means not just people taking MDMA, but people taking MDMA as part of a clinical practice with somebody who knows what they're doing and is able to guide that experience towards deep healing. I truly have come to the conclusion, I came to the conclusion many years ago, uh, while you know undergoing my own spiritual process, meditation, all that, I came to the conclusion many years ago that we live on a traumatized planet full of traumatized people who are hard at work traumatizing the people around them and often re-traumatizing themselves. Um, this planet does seem to be some type of sick ward or insane asylum for 
uh, very deeply um, shattered people and people who are carrying intergenerational trauma that, you know, certainly goes back to the two world wars and probably a lot longer than that, probably back to when consciousness itself dawned and people started wailing on each other with rocks or whatever the hell it is they did. Um, our work, you know, to be non-woo about it, our work as spiritual people is to end cycles of trauma one way or the other, whether that is individual, cultural, or even wider than that. So I'm a big, big proponent of anything which helps people to ease their suffering, or in many cases with things like MDMA-assisted psychotherapy can make profound breakthroughs in healing that, at least in my opinion, years, decades maybe of talk therapy uh, will struggle to be that effective. So let me just tell you a little bit about Cole, and I'll just paraphrase his biography here. Dr. Marta went to medical school in Chicago and psychiatry residence at UCLA Sepulveda Veterans Administration. And just as an aside for my non-American listeners, the Veterans Administration is the kind of hospital system set up and, and department of the government set up by the Department of Defense in the U.S. to provide health care for veterans and people who have served in the armed forces. I actually used to work there as a teenager and had extensive experience with um, Vietnam and Desert Storm vets uh, who were traumatized. And I think I talk about this in this podcast. Uh, Cole has extensive experience working with non-ordinary states as a longtime Zendo Project volunteer and supervisor, as well as through FDA and DEA-approved research like MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD. His academic focus is on psychedelics, their harms, and their potential medical uses, and he has published in peer-reviewed academic journals on Ibogaine, Ketamine, and MDMA. He sees patients at the California Center for Psychedelic Therapy in North Hollywood. He works with ketamine for treatment-resistant depression and treatment-resistant PTSD. Ketamine treatments are done in the office by himself or mental health staff with specific training in working with non-ordinary states. He's leading the Los Angeles team for MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD Phase 3 studies sponsored by MAPS and hope that this will be offered, and he hopes that this will be offered at his clinic's pending FDA approval. So I met Cole, I met Cole, I think, uh, I met him at a rooftop party that I was invented, uh, invited to by Duncan Trussell, and I have not, you know, gone through his clinical practice or anything like that or, or witnessed him in a, clinical, uh, in a clinical setting at all. But I told him at the time, and I think I tell him on the podcast again, he's doing God's work because MDMA-assisted psychotherapy is one of those rare things in life that I think truly could change the world. And I say that as a cynical, uh, nearly 40-year-old man, you know, having been through so much of this stuff. That is one thing that I think could truly improve people's lives on this planet. So, caveat. This podcast was recorded in mid-May. So it was recorded before George Floyd died and does not touch upon all of the uh, you know, the the new realities, the arguments, the conversations that have come out of that event, and obviously the, you know, massive protests and rioting and everything that's occurred, you know, the massive sea change that's occurred in this country since the end, just the end of May, right? Uh, the reason I haven't released it until now is because I was just going through my own shit, you know, like trying to keep um, my loved ones safe, trying to stay out of, um, you know, the path of Corona. And I, I moved three times in a very short period of time and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, um, so it's, it's not, I won't say it's out of date, but it's not totally up to date with the current uh, political situation. And obviously we don't touch upon, um, uh, post George Floyd reality in, in the slightest just because it hadn't happened yet. However, what we're talking about is certainly still applicable to it because we're talking about trauma. We're talking about trauma treatment. Uh, there's a lot there. Um, so we we touch mostly on the COVID situation uh, here. So just please be understanding that it's, uh, you know, just please be understanding that this was recorded in mid-May, but it's on timeless issues. Now, the other reason that I haven't released this podcast until now is because I have been hard at work on my other response to the current situation, and that is 
drum roll please, a completely new mega course. So the course is now out. It is being released just as this podcast is being released simultaneously. And it is called The Alchemy of Chaos. You can find it at magic.me. So it's M-A-G-I-C-K dot M-E. It should now be the top thing on the page. The Alchemy of Chaos is everything that you need to retake 2020. It's everything you need to get back in the driver's seat, to retake control of your life, to cut through the murk and the bullshit and the confusion, to develop a solid plan for how you're going to go forward into the future. And that means physically, emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, and most of all, economically. This is a course that is designed to create an adamantine vehicle for you, a diamond vehicle. A vehicle is a worldview, a set of tools, a set of skills. It's a state of being. And with all of the attendant actual tools needed to actualize that state of being. Vehicle is a term from Eastern Eastern spirituality, particularly Buddhism. So a diamond vehicle, in the context that I'm using it, is a mindset and set of tools that will allow you to walk through explosions without looking back. Just like you know, Lethal Weapon or uh, MacGyver, or, you know, pick your cheesy 80s movie, Rambo. Actually, let's carry that metaphor further. I mean, the cheesy 80s and 90s action movie metaphor or mode of discourse here. The traditional goal of alchemy, so the course is called Alchemy of Chaos, meaning the alchemical process of turning chaos into your chosen order. The traditional goal of alchemy was turning lead into gold. So lead, uh, which or chaos in the traditional way of thinking was unrealized consciousness, or it was just a bad life experience, an unawakened and miserable life. And gold was the state of enlightened awareness of a sage or of a redeemed, heroically redeemed existence, full of meaning, passion, and, and God, right? That's the traditional meaning of alchemy, and everyone knows that, or should, lead into gold. Now, one other version of alchemy, or part of the alchemical process, which is not as widely known, but is, you may still know it, is fixing mercury. One of the great goals of the alchemists was to fix mercury, meaning to take mercury, which is liquid and rolls around, and stabilize it so that it is solid. And this is, of course, a metaphor for one's wavering thoughts and things like this, or... or is a metaphor for a life that is lived in a dissolute manner, you know, where you change interests every few minutes, where you can't focus, where you drift from one career to the next or one relationship to the next or one failed scheme to the next. This is actually how most people live their life. Napoleon Hill wrote a great book about this called Outwitting the Devil. Most people live their life purely reactive and purely drifting. But an alchemist, somebody who fixes mercury Uh, stakes their claim and fixes their existence on achieving their true will, which I've talked about a lot on this podcast. But let's carry forward that that 80s, 90s cheesy action movie metaphor. Remember Terminator 2, the T-1000 as played by Robert Patrick? So this just just suddenly, you know, I realized the T-1000 represents the state of fixed mercury. You know, so he's constantly being shot, stabbed, blown up. And then he liquidizes into mercury and then and reforms. This is what I am offering you in the Alchemy of Chaos because I'm currently recording this podcast intro at the end of June. We are currently in a lull period where things are kind of, uh, you know, copacetic, kind of uh, a little calming down a little bit. I truly suspect that's not going to last for long and I have no idea what's going to happen. Nobody does, but... If there's one thing we can probably be sure of, there's going to be a lot more chaos in 2020. We have the continuing corona crisis. We have the upcoming elections and all of the attendant political issues, uh, the political battle going on in America and in the world uh, that hinges upon that. And most direly, we have what is very likely to happen within the next few months to to a year, possibly a little longer than that. But in that time frame, we're going to start seeing the serious economic fallout of the response to corona. 
So that means, you know, destroyed businesses, destroyed livelihoods, collapsed economy, collapsed stock market, collapsed real estate market, potentially, there's going to be a lot of people out of work, and a lot of financial hardship, like fallout or walking dead level economic hardship. So what is on offer in this course is the diamond vehicle or the fixed mercury that will allow you to sink a mindset and the tool set that will allow you to sink those hits and reformulate. So let's go through real quick. You know, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the type of stuff that's in the course. I'm not going to tell you everything because, you know, it's a huge course. It's a mega course, much like Adept Initiative, if you've taken that one. Uh, it is uh, not, by the way, the next uh, mega course in sequence after the Adept Initiative. The sequel to that is still coming. This is its own specialized mega course. You don't need to have taken anything uh, to take this course. You don't have to have any exposure to magic or have taken Adept or any of the other magic.me courses at all. It's standalone. And let me just give you a little overview of what's in it. So we're going to start off with ensuring your survival. <laughs> okay. Right. Number one, survive. And we're going to go through the, the chakras in order here, in a sense, metaphorically. So number one, we're going to cover your survival needs. That means making sure you stay alive, that you have reliable sources of food, that you have shelter, that you are safe, um, and making sure that, your that you can survive collapses in infrastructure. And there's very specific information and ways to do that um, that we're going to go through. It is very possible, right? It will, it will require prepping from you. So this is a bit of the prepper part of the course. But it's very possible to cover yourself from breaks in the infrastructure. For instance, food not being there. You know, And we all went through that in the last few months. So we can't pretend like that might not happen now because we all saw that break down at least momentarily. Two, we're going to go through how you need to re-change what I will broadly call socialization during this time period. So formulating, first of all, how to come back out of isolation, because a lot of people are still isolated in quarantine, not everyone, but some people still are. And a lot of people are kind of um, wonky and traumatized from that isolation. So we're going to go through and put in a rock solid framework for who you are responsible for and how you can socialize in a way that will not jeopardize your safety. That doesn't mean masks and all that. It means emotionally. What is the emotional framework for rebuilding community and society? And in fact, how can you build community in a way that will keep you safe going into the years forward, right? A network that you can rely on. Um, much like we did in the Temple of Psychic Youth, right? You know, Temple of Psychic Youth with Genesis, we spent years building that type of thing. And I have a lot to share on that front uh, because you can't know but the, the whole survivalist thing. If you can just prep for the apocalypse is total BS. The only way that you can survive times like this is with a strong network. That's just how it is. Uh, nobody, you know, just rambos out and like lives in a bunker for 15 years. That's just delusional because you can buy all the ammo and all the food and, you know, bunker down in an underground bunker and prepare to wait 20 years. Um, and then you break your foot. Okay, what now, right? You need a network uh, for emotional and psychological health too. You know, survival and thriving is a team sport. And the goal here, by the way, is not just to survive, but to triumph, right? To be stronger than ever before. Third, we're going to cover self-defense. And that means obviously physical, but it also means uh, mentally and psychologically uh, uh, defending yourself from, you know, I'm sure you've experienced a lot of the psychological fallout of this situation. I have, as you might imagine, a tremendous toolkit to very tangibly help with that. All kinds of goodies. It also means defending yourself in the online world, as particularly now that people are in isolation, the digital commons is the commons, right? And so we see, uh, we see that being negotiated in, in very destructive ways every day. And it also means uh, just online security in general, keeping your communication secure, um, in, a, in a more tangible way. Fourth, we're going to go through the heart. So we're going to go through your primary relationship. There's a lot of divorces, failed marriages, broken relationships that have happened in the last few months. Um, there's a lot of strain has been put on relationships. Nothing is as important for your, uh, your, your, your survival, and particularly your emotional and psychological health, as forming, maintaining, and 
uh, making sure that your primary interpersonal relationship with a partner or partners and family are are uh, solid, right? Then that's a source of strength for you. We're going to cover a tremendous amount of material there. We're going to cover how to maintain strong relationships, you know, the type of stuff they should have taught you in high school and the type of stuff that people struggle with their whole lives. There's some really serious tools on offer there. Um, that part is possibly going to be my favorite part of the whole course. Fifth, we're going to talk about economics and business. So I haven't verified this, but somebody told me a couple days ago that Yelp just reported that 41% of the businesses on their network have per- have reported that they have permanently gone out of business. The unemployment rate obviously is catastrophic. Um, people have been saying this is not a Great Depression. It is a new ice age potentially. And honestly, I don't think that we've seen the worst of it yet. I think that we're in a temporary period, again, a lull where the market is being artificially inflated. Obviously, I'm not Nostradamus, but I think anybody can tell you that when the economy slows down this much, the devastation will be unprecedented. If people can't work, where's the economy, right? So it's also quite likely that many of your plans, your previous business, your career, your skills, the person that you built prior to this happening may be totally outmoded. It may be invalid at this point. A lot of people are in that situation, particularly if you work in the service industry, food, uh, anything that involves close contact with people, uh, or just if you're in an industry which is going out of business. Hospitality, again, Yelp, VRBO, these are, you know, uh, uh, Uber, these are going through serious problems. And the whole economy is going to have to be restructured and rethought. Uh, there's exciting things about that because we can end up building a completely new world, but there's going to be a lot of suffering in the meantime. And so this is going to be a critical part of the course. What we need to do here is let go of the prior plans and, or reformulate them, rebuild them and come up with a solid business structure that may involve either changing your existing business or creating a completely new business plan or career plan that will allow you to economically thrive during this time, right? It's gonna require a lot of thinking, but we have the tools, we, you know, we have the technology, we can build it, as they used to say, if those of you who are old enough to get that reference. So once you get out of the trauma, the, you know, if you're anything like me, you've probably been experiencing a lot of things like brain fog, haze, uncertainty, periods of time where everything seems fine and then maybe late at night you start to freak out again or just waves uh, and just a general gauzy perhaps feeling or uncertain feeling that feeling is caused by whole scripts that you were running on just no longer being possible right it it's just like dark chunks in the, your prior life script and your brain is not, like can't catch up, right? So we're going to do that catch up work. And once you get out of that brain fog, that haze, you will be able to see very clearly that this is a time of maximum opportunity. It really is. Times like this of uncertainty, of maximum pessimism, that's when the most money is made, right? And that means starting new business ideas. It also means investing opportunities, right? Real estate, for instance, and investing in companies that will be doing very well in, in the new reality. All those opportunities are there to see and to be taken advantage of. But if you're stuck in the Trump, uh, in the traumatized loop, you won't be able to take advantage of them and other people will. By the way, anybody who ever said that magic is too pure and high-minded for manifesting uh, wealth, money, and abundance clearly didn't live in 2020. And enough said about that. Enough said. So we're going to go through all that and we're, you're going to walk out of this course with a solid economic plan for generating wealth and abundance far into the future, potentially way more than prior. And anyone who's taken Adept Initiative or Fortuna Working can tell you how solid that material that I give people is. And we're not going to recover that material here. We'll touch upon some of that, but this is going to be a new package. There's going to be a lot, a lot of exclusive information offered here. Almost every day, by the way, I get people writing in uh, telling me that off the back of Adept or Fortuna, they have 
gotten the job of their dreams, that they are now financially secure, and they're getting all these different income sources when before it was just paycheck paycheck to paycheck, hand to mouth. Uh, And that makes me really, really happy because there is there are a few feelings better than not having to be afraid of the wolf at the door, right? So we're going to cover you there. There's a ton of material on offer. So once we get all those bases covered, right? So meaning we get your house properly built and there are no leaks. So that means covering survival needs. It means covering community building. It means covering self-defense and community defense. It covers primary love relationships. It covers uh, business and economics and how to secure yourself economically and which is securing your safety and the safety of your family and your loved ones well into the future, right? Nothing could be more important. Once we get that stuff handled, then it's at that point that we can get into the metaphysical and spiritual dimensions of the situation. Primarily, our big task here is going to be reformulating our life script, right? Because there's a lot of just stuff that's just not valid anymore, right? And uh, psychological health can be defined. The line of psychological health, some schools of psychology define as whether one can adapt to reality as it is or whether they are clinging on to an earlier developmental stage or life stage, which is no longer valid. A lot of people are going to stay clinging on, right? And they're going to live in in psychological disturbance because of that until they're able to move on. You can probably think of some clear examples from your life or people you know. So we're going to reformulate a script that will allow us to bring out our inner magician, our inner hero, that will take us from, you know, maybe we're a little phased here. Maybe we feel like we got sideswiped on the freeway and things are confusing to remembering who we truly are, right? From that that position of remembering your transcendent self, your true will, you can reformulate your whole life overnight uh, in an instant in a way that is empowered and uh, is, you know, allows you to draw the sword from the stone once more and reclaim the position of heroic, the heroic stance in your life, the hero of your own narrative, rather than staying in this kind of dizzy state of, oh, all this stuff is happening to me, you know, and and being off kilter. That's critical. So we're going to have a new life script. And then on top of that, finally, we will work to, we will integrate all of this at the most profound level, the spiritual level, uh, the connection with whatever you call it, God, the divine, the universe, the transcendent source of everything. When you're in line with that, the details of the physical world don't matter so much. And, uh, you know, when you're in touch with the person who is running the game, the details of the game don't matter so much, to put it in gaming terms, right? And this is, of course, what the world has lost. Our our modern society, postmodern society, whatever, you know, whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, late capitalist society has turned away from the even the idea of the existence of some higher power right and this is the source of the mayhem it's it's a big source okay so that's a lot that's a lot to cover now i've just really just glanced over the surface there i've just given you the scheme of the structure of the course so you know what to expect and you understand that like we're really it's going to be a one-stop shop here we're going to cover every angle of what you need to do, not just to recover from a disaster, but to formulate yourself in such a way that further disasters can't really phase you, right? Now, that doesn't mean that they won't be distressing. Um, I'm not promising miracles here, but they, it does mean that you'll be able to roll with punches very easily because you will have formulated your life plan in such a way that factors in for what is inevitable, which is there's going to be a lot more chaos And, you know, I don't know if that's going to stop. You know, I don't think things will go back to normal. I don't. And whatever new normal they offer us may not be that great if you go along with what is new normal for all the people around you. If you create your own new normal, different story, right? The point is you need to be in the driver's seat of your life. You need to be in control. You need to be the hero of your own story. And you need to walk through explosions without even noticing, without looking back. That is what you will be able to do. 
with the adamantine vehicle, the diamond vehicle produced by the Alchemy of Chaos. So I've been working on this course nonstop for three months, and uh, it's time to bring it to you. So I'm very excited about it. The course launches mid-July, and we are currently running an early bird sale, which means uh, it starts now and it goes through July 4th. So it's the week leading up to 4th of July, and uh, we have some nice offers there. So enough of me talking about it. Go check out the page now. You can see everything that we have on offer. We, you can see the, the discounts and the offers that we're making for the early bird. So again, that lasts through 4th of July. The course will be available after that, but it will be full price. And then the course launches mid-July. It is another big, massive mega course, much like the Adept Initiative. And there's a lot to cover, a lot. And uh, you're going to get a full toolkit. You're going to get everything that you need to not just survive this period, but to triumph when everyone else is reacting in fear. You will be heroically triumphing. All right. So that's where I've been. That's what I got. And I'm really looking forward to seeing you in that course. How's it going, Cole? Thank you very much for uh, being on the podcast and and uh, setting up with me here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yes. So can maybe we can start off of, there's a ton I want to talk about, but maybe we can start off if you just want to tell people a little bit about who you are and what you do and how you came to do this. Sure, sure. Uh, so my name is uh, Dr. Cole Marta. I'm a MD psychiatrist. Um, and, uh, I do psychedelic research and psychedelic clinical practice now, um, primarily working with ketamine at my clinic. Um, the clinic is called California Center for Psychedelic Therapy, um, and also do research with psychedelics like MDMA and hopefully some other psychedelics as they become, um, things that we can do research on. Uh, things, some things on the horizon are like psilocybin and ibogaine, and um, and how I came to be doing that. Well, I kind of always had a. I kind of, I guess, my parents were deadheads, so I kind of had a, a different understanding of psychedelics from, uh, from, just growing up around environments where those were happening. Primarily grateful that shows, um, and uh, so 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 you saw people with proper set and setting and and trip coaching. I'm guessing then, right? And people taking care of each other, like you know, there's the Zendo project now that Maps operates, and I've done some work with. But before that, there was like Wavy Gravy and his crew did similar kind of trip sitting um, support services at Grateful Dead concerts and other kinds of things like that. So. Um, by the time I was getting my, when I went to medical school, I actually thought that psychedelics were the realm of neurology. So I was planning to study neurology because I thought, you know, the, what psychedelics do seem so profound. There must be exciting research happening with them. Uh, and then... Came to and find was out that not that was not the case at the time? Or? No, not really. Neurology is more for hard structural neurological injury stuff. Primarily, the world of neurology is well, a lot of like working with seizure disorders, neuromuscular problems, strokes, um, neurological injuries. Um, but psychiatry is more involved with. Uh, mood states, perception, um, more the mind and brain, and where they interact. So, one. So you went. You went to med school specifically to because you were interested in psychedelics and working it into some type of clinical practice. Well, that's why I was attracted to the brain and the mind when I was in med school. I went to med school more because I was good at science and I could get into medical school. Okay. And, um, and uh, but once I was there, that was 
that was like what I thought must be the most interesting thing that people are are looking at, but um, found nobody interested in it <laughs> until I was about to graduate and pick my specialty. And uh, actually a classmate gave me an article about what MAPS was up to now, which I'd heard about long ago. So, uh, so MAPS is, for those who don't know, the multi-associational... Multi wait, what multi does MAPS stand for again? Multi the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. And they've, they uh, are a nonprofit organization that funds um, psychedelic research. Like legit FDA... DEA approved research, which is, um, you know, which is the path kind of to uh, getting these powerful medicines back in to the world of medicine. Right. What time period was this? This was 2010. Oh, I okay. I sort wow. of rediscovered MAPS. Um, when I was in college in 2001, I actually wrote a paper citing some of the things published on their website. Um, but never thought that I could like be involved with them or anything. So when I got my MD, I reached out to them and it was kind of like, you know, I'm excited about the work that they're doing and could they use the help of somebody with an MD? I think the, the science is there, but we have to go through the painstaking process of proving it and doing the science. So, and, and that's still happening right now, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, I had to do my psychiatry residency, which I did at a VA, to um, partially the reason for um, doing my residency at a VA was to get uh, as much experience as I could with PTSD, which I knew that was the sort of target, um, the target diagnosis for the MDMA research that MAPS is focusing on. And so I finished my residency training just as these studies were finally getting off the ground. And so kind of our ships collided at that point. And I started the, the site here in Los Angeles. There's about 12 sites for the MDMA study. Wow. So maybe because I'm actually not totally clear on the details. So you're doing clinical practice right now, but it's part of trials or. ah, So it's. I had to start two separate companies. Um, one company is um, my clinical practice, and I work with uh, psychotherapists, and we provide things that are currently medically available. And then a second company is a research team, and we that's the company that does clinical trials, uh, does clinical research. The idea being that um, once these treatments become available, they'll kind of be something we offer in our clinic more broadly to people. Like right now, the only available psychedelic treatment or psychedelic that's uh, in our sort of medical catalog right now is ketamine, which is great because it's really useful. It's really powerful. Um, but so clinically for people looking for treatment at the moment, ketamine is the only one that's technically available. The other ones, people have to qualify for a study. Um, and the goal of that work is to do the science and demonstrate the efficacy of the treatment. It's not a wraparound care and ongoing care the way we would in our clinic. So I have a, well, I have a fairly big question to ask you here. I, I, Certainly in my own personal experience, and I would guess probably for a lot of people listening to this podcast, I've had, well, let's say someone I met has had very profound, uh, emotionally healing experiences on uh, particularly MDMA to the point where you have this sense, someone I met had this sense uh, many times, why can't everyone have access to this? Because there's so much emotional damage pain, wreckage, and heartache on this planet. And there are these substances that I will caveat if done intelligently with proper set and setting, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, proper antioxidant use and coaching have a tremendous potential to really heal people at a fundamental uh, emotional, psychological level. The question I want to ask you is, and I know you have 
uh, client patient or, or, you know, client confidentiality. So obviously I don't say anything that, I mean, you wouldn't anyways, but I'm, right. um, I'm wondering if in, in the framework of that, what I'm, I would love to know if there are certain stories of specific events, um, of experiences that you maybe had with, um, people who were being treated or, or maybe in your own personal life that, really made you a true believer perhaps or convinced you of the potential i mean there must have been something for you to dedicate your life to this in such a profound way sure i mean i think like i said you know it, it's it was not it wasn't new to me by the time i reached a age or training level that i thought i could be a part of it so you know like I literally grew up um, listening to bootleg, like, audio tapes of Terrence McKenna in the car on the way to school, you know? Um, and so hearing about profound, powerful experiences that people were having with these compounds as a sort of general class um, was just something that I had I was hearing a lot about um, growing up in high school and college, uh, but no one, it was kind of new to the rest of the world or not something I could relate to anybody on, like having those kind of conversations, like drug psychedelics were just clustered as drugs that are like party things and things that people did at parties. And sometimes people were crazy and would do mushrooms at parties, you know, (laughs) stuff like that. That was still the context. It seemed to come up. These compounds came up in other aspects of my life. And then, you know, socially, you know, you'd know somebody who took some, took too much for you know whatever setting they had found themselves in and had some crazy profound experience and yeah like to me it always seemed like it seemed crazy it seemed like silly to take you know some uh heroic dose of mushrooms and go to like a concert like yeah it, i always think of the Bill Hicks <laughs> joke of where he says you know i took mushrooms and went to astro world and i had a real bad time <laughs> right <laughs> Right, of course you did. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, so I think, you know, that was kind of how I had always heard about them. I had they had always been something that provided profound experiences, and um, you know, like early in, in like middle school, you know, I got. Carlos Castaneda books, um, and I was introduced to like Weechel Indian artwork and knew that it was related to their spiritual use of peyote. Um, so yeah, this like the profundity was was I was aware that they were profound before I was aware that people use them to go to raves or something, you know? Mm-hmm. What about in the clinical setting where, you know, then segueing from that understanding of it to um, uh, assisting people through PTSD treatment, you know, what the change was there and if there was a ra- if there was a real change in how you viewed these things? Yeah. Well, I think um, how that moved was, when I uh, when I reconnected to Maps, Maps was at that point, from what I understand, kind of they were promoting psychedelics in general. Like they wanted all psychedelic research to be done, and how it got focused was that was what Maps focused on. Maps um, chose PTSD as the target condition and chose MDMA as the target medicine as a way of consolidating resources. Like Mm -hmm. they couldn't, it's so costly to, you know, to, to fund just the MDMA trials that they couldn't also be trying to toe the line for LSD research and psilocybin research. And so different, organizations have sprung up that kind of 
focus on different compounds. And so because I was sort of at that point communicating with MAPS, developing a relationship there, working on different projects like the Sendo project with them, um, that's that's how the concept of this particular treatment for this particular condition came to me. Like the the first paper was being published, the first phase two trial um, was being published showing that it was actually effective for uh, PTSD in this small group that the study was um, had had researched. Um, and so, I, you know, read those papers. Um, early on, I got to watch videos of those particular cases. And it was just profound and moving. Like, my work mm -hmm. in the VA was, you know, 90% of my caseload was PTSD. So... What, what were some uh, of those videos you're talking about? You're seeing, you're you're watching cases that were profound and moving. I'm, I'm kind of fishing for maybe a, a specific story anecdote. that you can share. Yeah, an anecdote of, yeah, of one that I'm particularly kind of, impressed you. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm trying to think of which ones have been made public. Um, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't want to violate any other privacy. So you know, that's like. Working under the yeah. FDA, um, that's one of the that's one of the responsibilities we have is you know right. tightly guarding that. I know that you know if you go to maps.org, uh, they probably have videos of people speaking and telling their particular stories, uh, okay. but uh, but the level you know the the healing is profound. And long-standing, you know, the the data itself is is, is incredible. Um, well, maybe speaking in 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 broad terms, what are the types of changes that you know, or or journeys that you see people uh, see occur with people, or you uh -huh. know, what are, what are you know, what are the, what are the changes that you see from this type of of approach? I think you know, um, one of the 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 core thematic occurrences is uh, a change from a worldview um, where the world is the enemy of the self, the world is trying to destroy you, the world is dangerous, the world is full of scary things, to uh, a feeling that the world might be safe again, that the world could be nurturing, that the world could be uh, safety. Safety is a big thematic um, shift in those people that um, we've seen, <clears throat> I've certainly seen, you know, shamanic types of uh, experiences. Um, uh, some people... What do you mean? What do you mean by that? Um, people having uh, experiences transpersonal experiences, experiences of um, that are typically associated with different kinds of psychedelics, like other than MDMA, um, shifts in their sense of personal identity, interconnectedness with all things, um, feeling of being another thing, um, being another being, um, you know, embodying a different species or something that isn't necessarily human. Um, uh, past life regression stuff has um, come up. Um, and a lot of the work is informed by um, different traditions in, uh, in psychotherapy. And there's an influence of a particular treatment called uh, internal family systems, where you're working with parts mm -hmm. of the self. Um, that has led to some really profound um, experiences of uh, dealing with the parts of the self. It gets pretty abstract and strange, but... 
Well, not for me. Yeah, probably not for a lot of people listening. <laughs> you know, oh, okay. So, yeah, that sounds pretty shamanic. You know, and particularly the, you know, uh, dealing with parts of self, that's really, you know, one of the things that, well, uh, I take from NLP, but also that it doesn't have to be NLP. It's, it's I think that it's just working with the human mind in general is understanding that you, you know, as well, to be poetic, as Shakespeare put it, you contain multitudes, right? There's lots of different selves running around in there. And there are selves that embody internal dialogues that may be uh, from people that you met or family members uh, that are part of your internal dialogue. And th those different parts can be working yeah. at cross purposes. Absolutely. Yeah. Right? So, uh, yeah. So, you know, um, a lot of work, a lot of the work when that modality is sort of, uh, when that modality is sort of summoned, like, because the whole orientation is uh, inwardly oriented to that person's experience. Like, we're, we're not, um, and this is the same with the ketamine treatment that we do, uh, and this is, in my experience, general across psychedelic psychotherapy, is we're not guiding somebody or telling that, you know, we're not interpreting things for them. We're not saying it's supposed to be this way. That's probably one of the reasons I'm a little hesitant to, like, you know, I don't want to paint the picture of a particular oh, individual's totally. experience when the 99 other people have completely, you know, some people lay there and are completely internally oriented the entire time and have profound experiences that are just not something the therapists get to share and mm -hmm. uh and others are very activated and animated and visual and um uh but yeah um well, maybe um, I, I totally get what you're saying. You know, it's like it's also like you know when I'm teaching meditation or other techniques, I try not to pre-color people's experiences by sharing too many of my own or saying what right. it should be like because obviously then it it it, it not only kind of pre-colors it, it primes somebody to have that same experience when exactly. maybe that's not ideal. You want them to kind of to go in um, cold, but maybe just to take it back. I mean, you know, we started to talk about all these kind of very like, you know, high special effects budget things, uh, you know, like the, the shamanic stuff. But I think what you said at the beginning um, is actually way more important, at least I feel personally. I, oh, it's all important. But when you said making the shift from a world that is unsafe to safe, that for me is, you know, when I was saying earlier about you know, I wish that everyone could have an experience like this. That's the experience. It's not like all the super shamanic stuff, which is fascinating, obviously, but that shift of the world becoming safe again. And, and you know, I think that in our lives, we can go in and out of that perspective based on events that happen. It's not as simple as, oh, there was a childhood trauma or parenting was not there. And so someone has the sense that the world is unsafe. Um, right. You know, events in somebody's life can shift somebody back and forth from that perspective, even if they've had, uh, and perhaps I'm speaking of myself here, even if they've had profound experiences that have put them back in a healed state. So right. that right there is such a core I mean, that's what it's all about, right? I mean, like, what else can you say about somebody's healing process than that? Either they feel the world is, is safe or not. And right. uh, obviously, you can't just, you know, they need to be in an actually safe world. You can't really, I, I, you know, somebody in the middle of bombed out Beirut right. or, you know, Bosnia in during the Civil War is not going to take MDMA and suddenly decide everything's okay. Right. right. So it's, it's, right. it's um, not about, uh, it's not about just getting high and feeling good. Right. It's about, right. um, yeah, the, you know, it has to be within reason. It's not just about wishful thinking or positive, you know, it's not about like the power of positive thinking, right? Like it's, um, somebody does have to be able to actually be safe. And the idea is getting them, from a place where, you know, for example, with the war veterans, they have, they were there. So this is adaptive. This is not a dysfunctional way of believing. Um, mm, that's a really good point. Right? That's There's a really like, good point. I haven't thought about that. 
it's not like right or wrong. It's not incorrect that the world is trying to destroy you. And there's an ultimate drive towards entropy on a larger level. Um, uh, and it takes great energy and effort to not be destroyed. Uh, at the same time, the world can be a nurturing place. And so it's, it's like taking somebody who has... It's almost it's it gets down to like a biological level where that biological system is trying to adapt and prevent its destruction by assuming that the world it lives in is always capable of being like that day, that one day right. where it almost was ended, because the biological system's like sort of purpose is to survive right is to at least survive until it can procreate like in a sort of larger biological way of looking at it so the biological system doesn't care if you're happy or un unhappy or enjoying mm. your day it's going to for a successful biological model like the human model to work and all animals i mean we see trauma in all animals and, really? Maybe say more about that because I haven't heard that before and that's really interesting. Yeah, there's actually some proposed... So like a, a dog, you know, like a dog that's been abused will have a lot of the same, like, it, it comes with the added, you know, uh, problem of being completely dependent on people. Um, but, you know, a dog that has been abused will be very reactive, can be dangerous, can you know, uh, ha exhibit a lot of the same kind of easy to trigger towards action that is the biological adaptation that we see in people with PTSD. It's just, this is really this is fascinating because it's basically the same with people or or children, right? Where if they're if they're dependent for survival on abusive parents, yeah, right? yeah which absolutely. is such a twisted it's such a twisted position to be in, right, right, which. You know that's um, that's an extremely complicated system to live inside of, and uh, so there have actually been some proposals for MDMA psychotherapy with dogs. I'm not exactly sure what the psychotherapy will be. I imagine a lot of hugging and, yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> trying to okay. have. A, I've I've always kind of thought like we've adopted this understanding that PTSD can occur from a single profoundly dangerous or negative experience, why can't we conceptualize that maybe we can heal through a profoundly connected and nurturing experience? And I think that that's ultimately the goal of the like psychotherapy that we provide is we're there to serve whatever healing process they need. We're, we're not trying to we're creating a safe container for that process to occur within. And we put trust in that internal healing intellect to guide them and us to follow that lead within them of what that entails. Does that entail laying here and sobbing for two more hours? Does that entail um, some kind of, you know, healing touch um does that entail uh dancing and like and experiencing joy for the first time in a long time reminding yourself that you can you know those kinds of mm. things are not uncommon well, that's beautiful I, I think it's well i think when i first met you i said it's like you're doing god's work and i completely believe it you know it's like <laughs> if there's one thing that i'm serious it's like if there's one thing that man it's I mean, specifically MDMA. I mean, I feel that a, a lot of these substances are very useful. Um, you know, psilocybin, uh, to some extent ketamine, although ketamine can be so kind of alien and insectile and not particularly loving in a way. But um, but Kim is a fascinating substance, uh, someone I met told me. And, uh, but, you know, it has potential for, I've seen people like seriously abuse it, uh, you know, seriously. And right. I think it is addictive, um, certainly right. psychologically. But it, I think particularly has, MDMA. Like, I feel like um, ketamine has that quality of alcohol where 
people make decisions once they're on it that they would not have made, you know, like no one plans to drink and drive, right? <laughs> yeah. Totally. No one, when and, they're sober, and, is yeah. like drinking and driving is a great idea. Um, but when they're drinking, that's not the same decision making process they go through. So I, I feel like when people have uh, access to, you know, recreational ketamine, it's it has a quality of, you know, it has a high abuse potential for sure. Has, yeah, and I've seen I've seen people seriously abuse it. I mean, it's like Timothy Wiley, who I interviewed on this podcast, uh, who is now passed. I think told um, Genesis Purage and Lady J, who have now both passed. You know, it doesn't get good until your hundred thousandth time. <laughs> you, you can imagine, like, and, but you know, and this is, uh, yeah, you know, but that's dedication. It, it's, yeah, it's dedication, but I don't think anything good particularly comes of it. It's like it has. It also has a certain soul eating quality to it. Uh, after a certain amount of use, I would say, and in my experience, someone I met's experience of it uh, has been that it is very um, alien, as opposed to MDMA and psilocybin, which are very much put you back in your humanity, which is what I think people That's really need more than uh, going further in the, uh, I don't know, the direction of becoming like a gray alien or something like that. <laughs> That's interesting. You know, like... Um feeling alienated at baseline uh is you know something we see a lot in in um working in mental health a lot of people feel alienated and it's interesting that you say that because they they get significant relief from having that space to go to um so, and i think definitely the mdma uh MDMA is so different in that it um, it does it's it grounds you so much in who you are you know your ego structure and it's you know it heightens your senses and all of those things that kind of give you a sense of who you are and where your boundaries are and how you're differentiated from other people and while psilocybin and I think ketamine shares this potential too to destroy those boundaries to have that they both have that um, disruption of the default mode network and experience of interconnectedness that 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 experience you know there's uh, a lot of data about the biological effect of ketamine but I think something that uh, an experiential potential for healing that ketamine shares with psilocybin is that potential to have that. There seems to be something in when people report having had that experience that's correlated. About, like a, ba a boundary break? Yeah. And uh, yeah. And even if it comes with a lot of anxiety, like that can be part of it, like not knowing what's happening when the, when the, uh, you know, the self is dissolving. Um, people get, uh, I think, an instinctual, um, not everyone, very, actually very few, but um, those people who do meet that experience with a lot of anxiety, I think there's a instinctual sense that they're dying, you know, mm -hmm. uh, an ego death experience where their sense of self uh, dissolves and they become... It's, it's usually a beautiful experience after that for people from what I've heard. Sure. Um, and, and that seems to have a profound effect that is not accounted for in just, you know, the biology of these medicines. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty, I would say that's pretty ubiquitous across all of these substances, you know, at high enough levels and DMT uh, is certainly, and, and the other psychedelics, <laughs> Uh, and the ketamine, the K hole, yeah, absolutely. Um, and but I wanted to circle back real quick. I mean, like your the the point you made, it was really fascinating to me. Where I, I think if I'm correct, but correct me if I'm wrong, where you suggested that a feeling of social alienation or of alienation in general can produce this sense of being alien uh, in the yeah. psychedelic space, which is fascinating because this, this is uh, someone I met used to take a lot of MDA. Uh -huh. And uh, had a, uh, that type of experience of having the um, 
experience a feeling kind of alienated from humanity, uh, not loved or uh, touched enough, perhaps, uh, manifesting as this sense of being, this is a long time ago, so manifesting as this sense of being literally a, like a, a, a gray alien. Uh-huh. Which was a d very disturbing, but at the same time, you said um, that there's a certain amount of relief from going to that space, which was interesting. And maybe you could say more about that. I think um, for, you know, in those cases uh, where that has been a, a central sort of um, belief, uh, I think it's just a relief to take a break from having to where you're allowed to be allowed to be an alien, you know, mm -hmm. allowed to be uh, transpersonal, to not be the person that you're, you know, all of the parts of yourself that you carry around the rest of the time. The social mask. Right, right. That rings and, totally true for me. That's really interesting. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, it's certainly an interesting phenomenon. Like, I think it's, it would be interesting uh, to, to look at that sub portion of the population and see, you know, ask about their different experiences with the different um, psychedelic compounds. Because, you know, there's lots of uh, uh, extraterrestrial or spiritual being experiences, that's like a, a big part of the DMT experience, right? The DMT and psilocybin come with a lot of, not necessarily of the, I haven't seen or read anything about people feeling like they're the aliens, but of experiencing. Yeah. Not necessarily like it, men it, from space, but you know, like Entities, other entities. Right, a, a, an inscrutable transpersonal presence. Intelligence, yeah. Yeah, interestingly enough, well, someone, I'm just going to keep saying someone I met. Someone I met uh, has, uh, you know, the the all the classic stuff you read, like the Terrence McKenna stuff of, oh, the DMT aliens, like that's never been the case. But with MDMA and MDA, uh, at least for someone I met, the transpersonal experiences have been um, orders of magnitude more profound. And the uh, the healing as well has been orders of magnitude more profound. And I think one of one of the mechanisms seems to be in both cases that and psilocybin to some extent has the same mechanism, but it comes with its own light show, as it were. Uh, yeah. Whereas MDMA appears to be much more programmable, is that it turns off whatever like the anxious part of you that will pull back from, for instance, looking at a trauma rationally. Right. And looking at something and saying, okay, well, you know, I feel okay enough and I feel safe enough to look at this clearly rather than hiding it out of conscious awareness. Yeah. Um, and, and really, you know, really coming to terms with it, as it were. And, and in the same way, the, 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 the feeling of safeness to go to um, really strange states of mind that might be, you know, that really you're just thinking yourself there. Right. But it right. becomes right. so much more profound in that, in that space. And, you know, we're, you know, one of the core kind of uh, mantras of the work is trusting the medicine that like following when you feel safe to follow that path. And, you know, perhaps it's because of the set and setting that we are always providing, you know, we're there to work with trauma, we're there to work on healing people come consciously and subconsciously charged towards a healing sort of thought trajectory. So when they feel completely safe and comfortable, uh, it wouldn't be surprising that that is th a path towards the deep healing itself, you know, being able to get out of one's own way kind of to yeah. find whatever. And that's, I think where some of those interesting anecdotes happen is like, where they find that healing is not is almost never where anyone thought it was going to come from right um and that yeah and it totally my, one of the mantras too is like you know to trust the medicine because you know maybe you're starting to just talk about your trip to the to the video store or you know playing video games yesterday but for some reason 
that thought is coming up now. There's not, you know, not, nothing's coming up for no reason. So following the, that train of like, so where is that? What's, what thoughts, what does that make you think about? What's coming up? And MDMA, <clears throat> it's neurobiochemistry is what it has been shown is that it it calms or stops the decreases blood flow to the amygdala which is where our sort of fear and anger and strong powerful negative emotions that usually stop us from being able to rationally um, review a traumatic experience that part is decreased and then biochemically it's also a stimulant so the prefrontal cortex the executive functioning the ability to process information is higher than usual you know it's mm -hmm. it's in the amphetamine family so you're right like that is um that is something unique to mdma is and what we certainly see is people are able to access and process uh, traumatic events, traumatic memories that would just be too emotionally overwhelming to even consider. And that's usually, I think, I believe personally that that is a big, that is one sort of um, rich vein f towards this kind of Cha fundamental change from the world is trying to destroy me to the world is maybe safer than I had thought because it's those horrible experiences that you can't go back and logically sort through because of the emotional charge that keep us convinced that the world is so dangerous in the first place. Right. Because it's you like know. it's like a fritzing, it's like a fritzing wire that is, can't be touched and is not conducting right. current. You know, it's like it's 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 it, it hurts to hold and it doesn't make sense. And and I think that when we can't, you know, a big part I think of healing is being able to contextualize past experiences within the the framework of a new story that is life supporting right. for the, the individual there. now. Yeah, right, exactly. And it's like I feel like a broken narrative is much more disturbing and upsetting for people like a narrative that doesn't make sense than any type of physical uh in 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 most cases not all than the actual event itself you know the actual emotional and physical potentially trauma of the event it's the break in the story that is most like uh kind of offensive to the organism as it were yeah, and feeds and and can be sometimes the sole purpose of unuseful parts, you know, or parts hmm. of the self. Um, you know, there can be over committed resources to guarding from these experiences that rationally almost never, never happen or, you know, there's there are it takes up a lot of psychological energy when you have these outlying sort of mysterious experiences that haven't been uh, had the knots untied and um, been integrated into the larger story. You have these sort of, it, in my opinion, feeds feeds the need for multiple parts because you've got you know, in the in the kind of model that we um, are exposed to in our training, the idea is that one of the categories of these working parts are protectors, and they can be they can be ones that are you know being orderly. You can have a part that sort of keeps track of a managerial kind of part, but then you have these parts that are just there for protection and when all the other parts are not getting the job done then in come you know the sort of save us at all costs protect right. us, protect our you know injured parts at all costs healthy or unhealthy we need to just like you know it's pulling the fire alarm 
sprinklers. Totally. The whole. Do you do you feel I've I've suspected this before? It's like, do you feel that when you invoke that type of or evoke that type of part out of somebody, or when you experience that, like basically when somebody is pushed far enough to manifest that part of themselves? It, they show their hand in a sense where you can usually see within that reaction, you can pretty clearly see what the original uh, traumatizing event was, maybe, right? Because they're reacting to the current situation as if it was the original one. Well, I think when those parts show up, it means, you know, I think what it's protecting against can be indicative of at least where there's pain mm-hmm. of that if that isn't too vague and convoluted, but like, um, but not at all, but, but sometimes the part is isolation, you know? So, and, um, you know, complete withdrawal could be the strategy of the, this particular part. Um, uh, so yeah, they come in all kinds of flavors and, but it, it's usually when somebody is, you know, you've, you know you've triggered one of these defender parts when someone is, you know, behaving in a way that doesn't seem otherwise explainable, you know, or like usually lashing out like most people, um, behavior that, that is outside of the norm for that person is mm-hmm. usually when you've triggered one of these parts. And um, and ultimately, I think one of the big under, you know, one of the big things to be aware of is, is they're, no matter how destructive they seem, um, they're usually, if not always, ultimately trying to help. It's just sometimes the way they're trying to help seems so destructive and seems like so out i think it could be it would be safe to say that the more destructive those parts can be the more intense the pain they're protecting from sure or the more because they're always no matter how destructive that behavior might be for example you know like serious drug addiction that part thinks that that's better than what it's protecting against. Yeah, absolutely. Which is, you know, a mechanism that I've certainly observed um, multiple times with, with heroin addiction uh, with friends where they are using it to not process a trauma. The problem being that right. it's just putting the trauma on ice and not allowing exactly. them to process it, you know. And so they're just pushing it into the future with the additional yeah. burden of the addiction. Right. And all of the trauma that that causes. Yeah. I mean, there it's escapist, right? Yeah. It, it's, um, but also protective, you know, it's like, what's what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, there's a rational, like, I, and I truly oh, believe sure. it's like, yeah. there's a rational reason behind everything that people do, even yeah. if it doesn't in the grand scheme of things make a whole lot of sense. But, you know, within their personal equation, they're probably weighing, at a deep level pros versus cons and you know there's a reason right right and so you know at least surfacing these things you know it's like as freud you know one of the things freud said that i I do like is that you know he said kind of the goal of traditional psychotherapy is bringing the contents of the unconscious into the conscious so that you can at least rationally look at them rather than just running off them as buried code you know ideally rather than being controlled by them and you know having ex- actions that are completely unexplainable to yourself. Totally. Well, maybe yeah. this is a good w- place to segue because I, I, one of the, one of the big reasons I want to talk to you is because of everything that's going on right now, right. With, with sure. COVID and we touched upon a few things here. One is the sense of it, you know, alienation, uh, from other people. One is the sense of the, uh, break in one story. And it occurred to me while, while you were talking about that, it's, you know, the whole world right now is going through a, a couple things. I mean, a lot, but it's going through a break in the narrative that doesn't make any sense. And that is com- which is bad, uh, just for narrative reasons alone. And is also combined with what I think is really psychologically bad for people, 
which is the sense that they don't have control. There are no clear answers on when it will end. And the, the, the goalposts are being moved all the time. The uh, answers right. about whether people will be uh, out of quarantine is being changed, which, you know, for me is kind of like the perfect recipe for learned helplessness. And in addition to this learned helplessness, people are being conditioned to be um, afraid of getting near each other, to be afraid of human touch. And I even saw a few days ago, they were saying, oh, your pets may have COVID, so don't get too close to your pets. <laughs> this seems almost, uh, I know I don't want to, you know, I don't want to push this too far, but, you know, it's certainly for whatever reason, it seems to be like a perfect storm for mass uh, traumatization yeah. and, 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 and cutting people off from the things that make them human, just touch, uh, being able to trust other people. And when I go out on the street, I notice... Uh, that people look very much beaten down, like beaten dogs. They don't make eye contact. Uh, people yeah. are immediately move away from each other. This is, um, uh, I think, phenomenally outside of the disease itself. The psychology of this is is phenomenally uh, destructive and and potentially long term. Yeah. Uh, and I really wanted to get your thoughts on that and and where we're at with that. Well, I think. You're completely accurate. Like, uh, it's playing on lots of um, psychological dangerous areas. The you know the fear of the unknown, the the not having some clear narrative about where this is headed, is triggering all of the anxieties. You know, um, I can't remember the exact quote, but there was something like, "The past is safe because." its dangers are over or its threats are over. So you have all people. anxiety is the future, right? Okay. Yeah. Like anxiety kind of is, oh, I see. Yeah. is an un, is a fearful relationship to the future. Um, and so it's certainly exacerbating all of that. And with regard to trauma and PTSD, you know, if, if we're accepting this kind of uh, reduction of it into the world as a fundamentally dangerous place that's trying to harm you, that's that's the message now, and that's that is what's you know, it is also a reality. So we have to like, I think our only way out of this is, um, well, if I knew the answer, I'd be a billionaire. But it, it's everything that I'm seeing and hearing in the news makes sense. Like we are dealing with a very real uh, threat and a very real thing. We do have to weigh it against the harm of isolation and cutting ourselves off from touch, the psychological harm of their reaction to it. And, and unemployment, the and harm unemployment, of unemployment, you know, which is the, the the worst, one of the worst things for people. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so, you know, the the safest way out is to have some sort of treatment for it, testing for it. I mean, I think everything that's happening makes sense, but it is it's interest. It's the first time uh, uh, that I can think of where our generation. I'm not sure if we're the same age, but we're probably probably yeah. ballpark. I'm uh, Thirty-eight. So yeah, thirty-nine. So. Okay. Um, it's the first time our generation's been asked to face reality in this way. The way how that do you, how do you mean by that? Um, that the world can be a dangerous place. Like we had, we experienced. I don't. I don't know. Well, it depends on your background. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we had nine eleven. We had the two thousand eight crash. But, even, you know. but I mean, but the but the reaction to nine eleven was business as usual. War in Afghanistan. War in Iraq. So like. Those people who went to to war after those people who were at Ground Zero certainly have had that not been asked of them. That's been thrust upon them. I see. But this is the first time. But like, if unless you were in New York or unless you joined the military and went to war um, and lived and you know experienced. You know, the war zone has never been on U.S. soil, right? Well, this is, and and technically, this is true. This is true for the baby boomers as well, unless you count the draft yeah. as its own kind of avoiding an, an imminent uh, right. threat. 
which which we can make the argument for, right? But the war was not here. And uh, right, it's nothing like if you lived in Vietnam at the time, right? Like, right. you know, or or Europe during World War II, you know, like entire cities just bombed out, like true, you know, the kind of instinctual, terrifying nightmare panics that we get when we go and we see no toilet paper on the shelf or no butter at the store, you know, those fears that it brings up, like that for me, I didn't even know I had, but the first time I went grocery shopping and there were like whole item, like whole categories of items gone, there's, you know, it triggers some instinctual like right fear that well but the lack you know, of access to food i mean how much deeper does it get other than lack of water you know what i mean right? like that's pretty that's 100%. pretty serious and that that is new to us like uh, our great grandparents or grandparents depending on generational lengths you know the depression they saw this uh if you were our generation and grew up in the soviet union you saw something like this Right now, if you live in Afghanistan or several regions in the Middle East, you know, or Africa, the world is yeah, a dangerous just, yeah. place. Yeah, uh, and there were tons of, I mean, during this whole period of, of you know, overabundance, perhaps, in America over the last two, it's, 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 a, it's not just a millennial thing, it's millennials and boomers, I would say, and younger, obviously. Um, you know, there were places in the world, like, you know, the former Soviet Union, the Soviet bloc countries, uh, many parts of Africa, uh, the Middle East that were, you know, experiencing uh, a genocide and trauma that is, you know, uh, of the same level as what went, what, what happened in World War II, or right. perhaps worse on a case by case basis, com comparing different parts of each, yeah. um, whether it's and Rwanda or wherever, yeah. you know. So somewhere in the world right now, horrible things are happening, right? Like mm -hmm. that. That is the world is also this dangerous place, and. Um, you know, if anything, it just, uh, to me, it, it calls for more compassion when we're back in a place where when we are out of this and we are past all of this, mm. realizing, you know, this is part of the human experience that we have just been very fortunate not to have had to endure yet. Right. And even this is not in the grand scheme of things, not, you know, it's not, there's not fighting. It's not, right. I mean, I remember the, I, I was in uh, Southern California during the LA riots, you know, I was a kid. I remember yeah. that, you know, it's not that, you know, that's right. in my lifetime within my lived experience, you know, watching in the sky was on full of ash from LA burning, yeah. you know, and I had to stay away from school to be out of riots and, you know, and some of that touched my life. So, yeah. um, in, in, in directly violent ways, but nothing too yeah. serious, but the, um, the, the fallout from that. And so, uh, yeah. I mean, but it depends also on where you grew up. I mean, there are tons of places you can grow up in the in the U.S. that are like war zones, right? You know, That's so. It, but I, I guess, and I, I certainly hope that it. You know, I think that we will probably get off lightly, knock on wood, in terms of if the worst that happens is people have to stay home for an extended slumber party. That's really not so bad. I am worried, obviously, about the psychological effects. I am worried about. Um, um, that people know deep down and that the state knows deep down of how quick the compliance with authority was. That concerns me. Um, but I think more specifically, the psychological, I'm, you know, when I go out on the street and I see people looking like beat down dogs, afraid to make eye contact, that's yeah. when it shows me that the psychological damage is starting to be real. Obviously, it's very easy for yeah. people in situations like that to pick scapegoats, uh, to lash out, and it's understandable to some extent. It's like somebody just wants something to blame, in a sense, or to direct to, to uh, expel the energy towards. And right. that yeah, I'm much more worried about, you know, I'm worried, honestly, about when people come out of quarantine and they look around at a destroyed world and X number of people, even if it's a very small percentage, are just going to do the proverbial, I'm not, I'm mad as hell and aren't going to take it anymore thing <laughs> for whatever story, you know, they convince themselves of why they need to do that. Right. And uh, that's concerning, you know, and, and particularly if this goes on for a long period of time. And uh, that's, I think, when the second order effects of this could be because right now, because people are quarantined, they're not fully seeing the second order effects 
And when that becomes more visible, and meaning unemployment, joblessness, uh -huh. the real ec economic structural uh, downturn takes a you know a long time to manifest. Um, it, that's people are going to realize that this is not just. Uh, it's it, the reality is going to sink in, and I think that's a very yeah. dangerous moment. Yeah, I, I mean, these are all. Um, this is traumatic. This is a traumatic event for the entire world for all of those reasons. We we can't assure our own safety. That you know is that is living in that world of believing that the, the world is fundamentally unsafe for all of those reasons, not just the virus, but all of these other reasons. Right. That the world is, you know, that economic collapse is, is afoot and um, everything you just mentioned. Like, all this, this is a traumatic event culturally in a way that we have been lucky not to have so much of up to this point for our for our generation and it'll totally. be it will be uh interesting to see how people respond to that like it, it's already interesting seeing how yeah. people are responding to that you know i certainly worry about uh you know false narratives and things like i feel like um not to go too far into the weeds in a totally different direction, but like, um, I really worry about our current political climate of competing narratives without regard for like truth. Um, that truth is perception is sort of the way culturally things to the scarier parts of culture are moving that, um, because, then it just becomes like a, it, it it muddies the waters of making good informed decisions, you know, when people don't know, when pe when people create narratives out of defense, you know. Yeah, it's it is scary, and and one thing, um, and I bring this up. I want to caveat this. I, I bring I, I'm totally on the same page with you on that. I bring this up, um, and I want to caveat this by saying I'm not bringing this up with a political trying to put a political spin on right, it or from right. one side or the other. But I think that for me, just in observing, you know, as an observer of mass culture, the moment when um, I forget what, when it was, it was, I think, the State of the Union address or something like that, when Nancy Pelosi tore up Trump's speech, him, uh -huh. and then he wrote this long uh, letter back to her, which was uh, very much ridiculed in the news. But actually, when you read it, it makes some fairly interesting points based on um, things like the Federalist Papers and going back through American history, um, that moment without coming down, I'm not, my intention is not to come down on one side or the other of that argument. For sure. me, it's simply, it's such a symbolically charged act of tearing the thing in two. And if you just look at the data, Congress, uh, you know, the two sides, the two political spectrums in America used to be very closely interlinked. And I at one point saw a visualization of Democrats and Republicans, how they were connected in terms of that they were talking to each other, at least, you know, uh. could talk on the phone. And so it, look, it looked like a big connected mesh with blue and red dots. And then you kind of speed it up over, you know, 30, 40 years. And you see those connections starting to drop until you end up, I think, basically at that very moment with two completely separate blobs blue and red with no connectors in between them you know there were a few people that were filling that were basically would go back and forth as intermediaries but now they're completely separated as if someone's cut down the center of you know cut the corpus callosum if you were and that act of tearing the thing in half is so symbolic of that complete breakdown between the two sides of america between the two political narratives and this was before covid you know, and yeah. and then to suddenly go into this, uh, to go from a, a position that people were already at each other like that, and that, right, to carry you know, that it, into this, carry yeah. that baggage. Maybe yeah, it's like good in a weird way that people can calm down and reflect a little bit, on, but or or maybe not. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a tremendous opportunity for everyone to get together, but. 
it almost seems like the industry of narrative creation has gotten so out of hand <laughs> that there's no we can't even unify on like viruses are bad viruses exist you know like there there's so much uh there's so much information out there without much guidance on how to what to do with that information or how to interpret that information or how what the the real meaning is of that information like that's uh i think culturally that's something i've been thinking a lot about lately is how much value we put in knowing stuff and like there's a psychological defense mechanism intellectualization that is not considered um, healthy or unhealthy. It's like considered a neutral defense mechanism because it doesn't actually often lead us to anything that's useful, but it also isn't necessarily harmful. It's like it takes up space. It takes up intellectual space to mull over information and as much as we as much as we're advancing and creating information and consuming information and having access to all of this information i think we're over we're over estimating how how powerful that is ultimately actually for our experience of you know, dealing with our emotional uh, experience on our emotional right. level, spiritual level. Totally. Well, that's the use of intellectualization, right? It puts it out into the realm. It takes something and puts it out into the realm of the abstract rather right. than feeling it immediately. Right now right. it can be manipulated as, as information and it can be now, but it, now it's not, it's, it's a type of armoring. Right. And I know right. this as a hyper intellectual right. person, but it is, it is a type of armoring, right? You know, I right. know this very well. <laughs> so you can create this, like this theory that like, you know, cell towers and Bill Gates and like all of these things, because you have all this information, you can construct some kind of narrative, but at the heart of it, we're not making a lot of progress that at the heart of all of those fears, true or untrue, is that I'm terrified, right? Mm. Like that's what's driving that narrative. And it's almost like that's what we need to start focusing on personally, you know, as a culture is, you know, as long we have so much information now that we can feed any emotional narrative with mm -hmm. content. Yeah, and that's 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 scary. It's definitely like a Philip K. Dick uh, world, <laughs> right? Right. Yeah, and and then you know, yeah, it allow you know, there's been you know these explosions in um, in like people who have very debilitating like psychiatric conditions, but can find groups of people online because they can scour the whole, un you know, the entire like typing world <laughs> um, for people who also believe, right. you know, that, you know, the sun is going to collide in the next five days or whatever, you know, like, right, right. You know, all the like doomsday thing, you know, all of these. Yeah. I mean, pick yeah, any. it's crazy. Those, I don't know why I pulled those out of nowhere. Well, but, I mean, but yeah, totally <laughs> right. And it, it, it's like, and it, it's like a world in which confirmation bias is given free reign, and yeah. there's no defense from it, right? And and any narrative can spread, and from a you know, this is a magical world. It is a world. It is a re-enchanted world in a sense. It is a world of competing wizards able to create different narratives, which for right. me I think is fascinating. But for people, I think the average, you know, for people who are inclined to, to find that fascinating with the kind of hacker mentality, that's fascinating. And that's, you know, was always the point that the occult world was making that things were like anyways. But now it's been made uh -huh. so manifest. But for the average person, um, and I don't say average diminutively, I think, you know, for the more uh, uh, cohesive person, let's say, um, having a narrative that makes sense and is linear is really important. Yes. Right? It's really important. So important that 
right? Like that, uh, that we will create one, even if it's completely wrong, right? Like it's important that it all makes sense. It's almost more important than that it be accurate. And that's dangerous when you're dealing, in my opinion, with with something like a virus that it, that does not care what your narrative is, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I I do believe in a fundamental fundamental phenomenon like the way viruses interact with DNA and that effect on the biological system that we inhabit, like. I do believe in a reality that exists outside of just my experience of the universe, you know? Right. And so that's where I think this that gets so dangerous that we're living in a place where any narrative can be very seductive uh, and totally wrong. Right. I, for some uh, reason, I keep coming back to Philip K. Dick here, but but there's yeah. a great, but there's another great, there's another great quote by him. You probably heard it, which is, uh, "Reality is that which, when you stop uh, believing in it, uh, continues to be there. You know, is is continues right. to persist. It's like you know, the sidewalk. You can stop believing in the sidewalk, but it's still going to hurt if you you throw yourself at it. You know, exactly. Yeah, so. all the people who've tried to you know, walk through walls and found them just with broken noses. Like <laughs> right. there is an unfortunately there is unfortunately an insurmountable um reality, you know, pheno- there's some phenomenon that ex- exists uh, outside of your beliefs and perception of how things are working. Yeah. And that is problematic if we are, you know, when we are moving towards a culture of warring, uh, w- warring narratives, and and it's really problematic when because there isn't much regard for um, it gives the impression of a false equivalency, right? Uh, that's I think that's the sort of toxic like final. Oh, I see where it's like puzzle is like right. Or you have to consider both sides of the narratives and like narrative and maybe the truth's in the middle. Right. Right. Where one part can just be totally one hundred percent false and bat totally crazy. Right? right. It's like, well, we have to look at both sides. Well, not really, because you know, some things just aren't true. <laughs> right. Right. Like in yeah, and like in in times like this when everyone is panicked and intellectualizing and has access to all this information, like any anyone with a computer can get all the information I know from an entire you know eight years of you know combined molecular biology and genetics and medical school and then four years of site like. All that information I was exposed to, everyone can get that information. But then without it's like without having actually worked and seen and experienced these things, they are ultimately still so open to be interpreted and filtered through what they right. think that information means. Well, it's knowledge and not understanding. It's knowledge and not understanding and, and it's certainly not wisdom. Right. Right. It's just dead. It's like dead data. Right. 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 It's like, um, it's like, uh, Goodwill Hunting. Did you see? Mm-hmm. Did you yeah, of course. I love that movie. Me too. I love that movie. The when story of my Will, life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When, uh, when Will, um, totally smashes Robin, uh, Robin Williams's universe by, you know, diving into his painting and you know says like some horrible things and accuses him of picking the wrong wife and all this stuff and it smashes Robin Williams and then Robin Williams finally reaches out to him again and he brings him back and he basically tells him this like he says um, you're just a fucking kid you don't know what you're talking about ultimately <laughs> it's the, it's okay. the thrust yeah. of the conversation and he's like you're so smart, you know, like, I bet, I think he says, I'm like, I bet if I asked you about love, you would recite me, uh, you know, the sonnets, you know, of William Shakespeare. And if I asked you about, 
you know, uh, painters. You could tell me everything there is to know about, uh, you know, um, Italian uh, painters, but you don't know what it smells like inside the Sistine Chapel. Like, you don't, you've never been in love. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's that quality I think that is coming up in this conversation to me of like, you know, we, people have access to information and they're confusing that with wisdom. Like you said, yeah, absolutely. It's like, the uh, wisdom, absolutely. We're, we're limited by our language. Those people who are wise and experienced can only use language is the only tool they have, but that doesn't mean the reader gets what the, the wise person is saying exactly i mean and this is just a fundamental flaw in human communication but the internet allows people to particularly because there's no tonality or context behind things it allows people to you know the the image that was coming to me as you were talking about this it's like somebody collecting just more and more legos and this is just a gigantic box of more and more legos but they don't know how to put them together and they haven't assembled them into anything meaningful it's just like they're getting more and more of what could be put together and then they're assembling them in weird ways, which is kind of fascinating in a way because they're coming up yeah. with new, new stuff. It's you know Absolutely. they're recombining, but it can yeah. also be they can also end up making uh, uh, mimetic weapons. Yeah, you know, no, it's bio weapons and fun to engage with because like I feel like some of my best ideas have come from trying and probably failing to understand someone else's good idea. <laughs> like, <laughs> there you go. Right? Like that's like a. Uh, that's the sort of uh, the magic of, you know, interacting with other people in that way. Like our conversation now, like I'm sure I'm only approximating understanding exactly what you're trying to communicate to me, but it's a fun endeavor, what it's inspiring in me, you right. know, well, human even if it's a misinterpretation. Right. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of it on Zoom now, you know, it's like, <laughs> that's right. but, uh, um, well, well, I guess we're we're. I don't want to take up too too much of your time, so, but I want to um, end perhaps on this note, which is that um, we've been talking maybe for the last twenty minutes or so about these big uncontrollable things in the world, which ultimately can only be a source of more anxiety. Uh, and we're we're doing what if and and this. I really I think possibly the most important thing that I want to know from you and the, the listeners probably want to know is, you know, I I was initially going to ask you, you know, how can people heal from this? But I think that the more pressing question is what can people do right now to stay uh, in a health, to stay psychologically healthy in this situation? And then maybe we can talk about, you know, kind of reversing some of the, the trauma of the situation after the fact. But since we don't know when the after the fact will be or even what it will look like, or if it will be some kind of amalgamation of this and the prior reality or something altogether new, maybe it's premature to talk about that. And it'd be better to talk about what people can do now to stay healthy. I think now, um, there's trying to mitigate all of those things we know are harmful, like mitigating the isolation by trying to interact with people, um, mitigating, you know, the being confined to your home by, you know, taking walks, what, whatever it is that you feel is being taken away, trying to mitigate that as much as possible. And then, you know, in bringing it back to the first point about, you know, how trauma can affect whether you see the world as an ultimately dangerous or ultimately safe place, like, every, things are changing. And if you've made it this far, this would just be my personal advice, if you've made it this far, you've been able to adapt to all the changes you've ever confronted before. This is going to be a huge change, but it's that ultimately where we cross over into thinking that the world is dangerous and trying to harm us because of all of this change. It's like losing that faith and trust in yourself to be able to handle this change which has never happened if you're still alive and you're here now. You've you've made it out of every big event of change and lived to tell the tale if you're still here now. So there's no reason to think that this big event it will be it will change in a way that's unpredictable. But 
one way to combat having fear about what that change is going to mean is to have faith or trust in your ability to handle that when it gets here. So anything that reinforces that, um, hanging out with people that you've done things with where you were surprised at your ability to manage change, um, to, to get through a difficult prior personal change, a personal apocalypse or a personal catastrophe, um, calling on those resources, I think is going to be important. Mm. Almost everyone is going to be able to make it through this and will be fine on the other side. So having faith and trust in your previous step, I'm not saying just BS yourself and have, you know, just try to have happy thoughts. You've been able to get this far. You've, you've always been able to, you have faith or trust that you've made it each time so far. I think that's important. That, I think that's great. It really well put. And I just, yeah, calling on the resources you already have, essentially remembering that you already have those resources from your prior experience to get through uh, crazy times or yeah. just change. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is. I think that's really, that's really We're key. We're going to have a, a different future. And because we don't know what that's going to look like, our survival instincts are to be worried about it. But we can also trust that we've, that we can handle whatever that change is going to be. It's going to be something we all find acceptable enough. Yeah. Well, let's see, as you, as you were talking about that, something came to me and I, I want your, your second opinion on this, your, your, your pure, sure. re, I want your pure, your pure review on this, if you will, which is that, um, it, it strikes me that, you know, so much of the, um, traumatized mindset is that one is consistently looking for evidence, um, that the world is an unfriendly place. And that, that is something it is looking for evidence that something that you must defend yourself against is about to happen. Right. And yeah. um, it, it strikes me that perhaps at least an interesting exercise would be to intentionally perhaps go through. I'm not saying to ignore that stuff, but to intentionally go through at least a part of each day looking for evidence that the world is safe. Right. Knowing that you'll, of course, find what you're looking for no matter, you know, that that. Right. That's just a, a true thing of human psychology. It's what what you look for, you will find, uh, totally. and no matter what you're looking for. So, yeah, those people that make you feel safe, those, you know, now's the time to draw on all your defenses. You know, uh, so if that's uh, having a scoop of ice cream and watching, you know, Goonies, then do it. <laughs> There's no better. Time I was just talking about now. Goonies yesterday. That's great. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. There you go. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and I would also note that most of the time, most things are going well, that it's, we're primed to attend to from, from, I think a deep biological place from survival to make note specifically of dangerous things and have that, have that take up, more real estate than it really may necessarily require. And so the news is nothing but, you know, I would say right. take a break from the news in general. Give your Anything truly break. fantastic will penetrate, you know, any gr really great information will get to you even if you're not watching the news. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, I agree. Uh, I mean, and yeah, keep that in mind that I agree. mostly everything's going. Great. Even in a time like now, there are lots of things that are going well. Absolutely. Well, maybe that's a good note to end on. Like there is yeah. lots that is going well. That's a good <laughs> thing to focus on. Yeah. We have Zoom. We can talk to people from all over the world or Skype, yes. rather, Skype conversation. All yeah. right. Well, uh, Cole, where can people find out more about you and, and your work if they want to know more? Sure. Um, my clinic is... Uh, www.psychedelictherapyca.com because it's the California Center for Psychedelic Therapy. Uh, and uh, yeah, 
psychedelictherapyca.com. Um, if people want to uh, donate to maps.org, they're the ones funding psychedelic research. It's historic. There's never been, to my knowledge, any medicine that has gone through the FDA approval process based entirely on donations from the people who may benefit from it. Well, um, I didn't know that. That's phenomenal. Yeah, it's either the government pays for it or a drug company who is going to sell that drug pays for it because we're talking tens of millions of dollars. So um, this is the first time that I'm sure... I'm sure it's the first time it's happened. Um, it's the first time I'm aware of it ever happening. That, yeah, that it isn't some scientific organization or a government program or something else that's paying for it. It's entirely being funded by donations. So, maps, M A P S dot org. And um, yeah, I think that's about it. All right. Phenomenal. Okay. Well, thank you for. Thanks for talking to me. It was a really good conversation with a lot of really important information in it. And so I want to thank you again for your time and hope to talk to you again soon also. All right. That was a great interview, right? I hope you really enjoyed that. There was a lot of really, really useful and uh, wise information offered there by Cole. So, the Alchemy of Chaos is now open for pre-registration at the Early Bird Discount. Go check it out. It's at www.magic.me, M-A-G-I-C-K dot M-E. And the early, bird, the early bird pricing only lasts through the end of the 4th of July, so hop on it before you can't. All right. I will see you in that course, and I will see you very soon for the next podcast. All right. Hang in there, everybody. 2020 uh, is already almost ha- is already half over so at least we got that going for us all right i'll see you soon